everyone, just in case some of you don't know me. Uh, I'm Professor Kessler, and I teach conversational English, and we're going to be working with you on this intercultural uh, experience. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Mindaki. He's from Mexico, and right now he's at the Earth Center at Columbia University's and he's going to explain some things about indigenous culture to you. How many people here are from a Hispanic background? Raise your hand. So some of you may feel familiar with some of the topics that he's going to talk about. Okay. Uh, my name is Alyssa Tiefel. I teach uh, the class on intercultural communication at County. Um, in that class, we learn about how people from different cultures kind of think and how that comes out in terms of uh, how they speak, why in certain cultures everybody's late all the time and that's okay. Uh, we learn, also learn about different um, religions and cultural practices, so, so this, this is very well done today. Yeah. Teachers and students and mm -hmm. Okay, and Professor Mandaki is going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about himself and why he became interested in this work. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kessler and uh, also the authorities here in, in the college. And uh, I'll try to speak up because my, my voice is very soft, so I'll try to, to reach the ones who are in the back. In the back. So, Now, now I'm a professor in, in the Center for Air Ethics in the Union Theological Seminary in Columbia University. And we are trying to, to come together with the ancient beliefs, like the more, mostly spiritual, spirituality from indigenous peoples or so-called First Nations. So what I want to, sh to present here is the biocultural, biocultural sacred, sites, sacred sites in Mexico, but it's also related to the, to the world because we are promoting this uh, in the UNESCO arena. So we, are, we want really to create this new uh, concept for protecting sacred sites worldwide. Um, could you please explain to the students what UNESCO is? Oh, yes. UNESCO is uh, an organization of the United Nations which takes care about education, culture, and science. So see, this is the place where more uh, heritage, cultural heritage is, is uh, acknowledged worldwide. So there are cities, there are uh, landscapes protected, and, and so on. So first of all, I'd like to say that uh, in the world, Around 3,000 years ago, there were more or less 13,500 different cultures. But because of cultural erosion and, and biocultural erosion, we have lost almost half in the world because of wars, because of many things that have happened around the world. We have lost many, many cultures. So nowadays, you can see mostly in, in, uh, in all continents, we have uh, around 7,500 cultures, which means that we are almost losing not just way of thinking, but also ways of, way, ways of doing. So this is very important because when we lose a culture, we lose also ways of, of relating to, to each other, relating to, to, in this case, with the ecosystems. So this, this powerful uh, concept about, about biocultural, you are going to begin listening and listening more. And there's a concept related to biocultural heritage. 
But in this case, I don't want to talk about bicultural heritage, but just about, about biocultural diversity. Because. Could you explain to the students what biocultural is? Oh, yes. Biocultural is the mix. And you, you are going to, to see that there are three special components. The, the very first one is biodiversity. Biodiversity, in other words, means the number of species that are on, on the earth, which means the plants, the animals, and all uh, livings, uh, all, uh, all beings in, on this earth. So you can see the, the most biocultural, uh, biodiversity uh, countries in the world. Those are named over there. Brazil is number one. And Indonesia, Colombia, Australia, and Mexico, and Madagascar. But on the other side, we see the ethnodiversity. So the number of languages spoken in, in different countries. And one of the most, uh, let's say, multicultural uh, countries in the world is Papua New, New Guinea. Another one is Indonesia, Nigeria, Mexico, India, Australia, and so on. So Mexico is, again, in that, uh, in that list, because uh, even though at the beginning of the 16th century, uh, there were kind of 600 different cultures, nowadays we are just 68 different cultures. Uh, but the relationship between biodiversity and, and ethnodiversity comes agrodiversity, which means domestication centers. Have you heard about this concept? Domestication centers is, is where, for example, the corn, where it was domesticated, the potatoes, the rice, everything that we eat once it was domesticated. Because, for example, the, the, the corn, at the beginning, it was not a corn. It was just simply, it was a grass with very hard seeds. So uh, people had to domesticate the plant. But the question comes, who domesticated whom? If the humans domesticated the corn or the corn domesticated the humans? That's the reason that's, that is a biocultural product. Do, do we understand that? So it's a, mi a mixture within nature and humans. OK, it's a result. So taking into account this, uh, these foundations, we find that Mexico is the second biocultural, world, biocultural uh, country in the world. But like in many other countries, there is no public policy to defend or to take care about this biocultural uh, biodiversity, biocultural diversity. And because there is no, Which one is the first one? it's a, remember over here? Let me check how, how can I go backwards? Oh, it's not here. Oh, it's here. You, you can see here Indonesia. Indonesia is the first one. Because it's all, also the, the place where you can find most biodiversity uh, in talking about plants and animals. Also, and this is very important because where there is more cultural diversity, talking about native peoples and First Nations, there is also uh, more biodiversity. Uh, it means where there is more cultural diversity, there is more, also more biodiversity. So it's related. And it talks about the philosophy the native or indigenous peoples hold, because mostly they live with nature, not from nature. So th that's, that's the fundamentals. Oh, I just passed by. So these are, these are the ecological zones and pollos originarios 
in the regions of Mexico. You can find several, several uh, ecological uh, regions from the mountains to the coast. And as you can see over here, by central south Mexico, is where until today there are more native peoples who live in the highlands and also those are called the hotspots. And uh, according with the scientists, hotspots is where the major biodiversity of the world exists. So there's, there's a very, very deep relationship with nature and the way of living of these peoples. So that's important that we acknowledge not just cultural diversity, but also the way of living with nature. So you can see all of different uh, peoples, Yaqui, Mayos, Purépechas, Otomíes, and you have heard about the Mayans, right? The Mayans live around this area, all of this from Chiapas to Yucatán and beyond until Nicaragua. Going back to the sacred sites, why sacred, site, sacred sites are important? Because sacred, site, sacred sites are like we, as people, we acknowledge that we have important parts of, in our bodies. So in, in the, on the earth, there are also important places where the life comes from. For example, the springs, right? Where the water burns. So sacred is an energetic property, either stable or, or femoral, which is a ecological place on objects but it has to be recognized collectively. Because I cannot say on my own just, there is a sacred site over there, or a sacred site. If just, it's just me. It has to be acknowledged by the collectiveness. So it implies natural and cultural worlds. So this, this is not a Cartesian point of view or the science point of view, but it's a complex point of view. And most sacred sites are in Pueblos originarios territories not just in Mexico, but around the world. Some sacred sites were converted in sanctuaries. Remember when there was no Catholicism or Christianism or, or other religions? So the sacred sites, even in some uh, sacred cities or some sacred spaces, they were building temples or churches on top of the sacred sites. And you can see some examples not just in Mexico, but elsewhere. Some are in danger, like Viricuta in Real de Catorce in north of Mexico, because mining, because fracking, because development, the development uh, infrastructure. So many, many secret sites are, are in danger. Some promote community conservation because they call together, the, the culture can come together and have fiestas or have some, uh, uh, let's say, rituals together. Some are vital to cultural cohesion and natural heritage because when you see a sacred place, you respect it. It doesn't matter what kind of religion you are talking about, but you got to respect, even if you, if you don't agree with those beliefs, you, have to, you got to respect the sacred. Being Muslim, being Sikh, being whatever kind of religion. So native people, we also have our beliefs, and we also have our sacred places. So we are talking about those sacred places that are vital for the, not just for the spiritual world, but for the material world. They are for different purposes, like pilgrimages, offerings, rituals, healings, some people go and walk towards those sacred places because they want to be healed or they, they want to pay back some favor or just depending about the, the, belief, the beliefs. But especially among native peoples, they do these pilgrimages acknowledging the sacred of, in nature, okay? So as you can see in this uh, 
map. One thing is to be a peoples, another uh, sometimes is overlap with cultures, because one, one peoples could have different cultures. For example, the Aztecs, or the, the so-called Mexicas, they live in the highlands, and they also live in the jungle, or they live in, by the desert. So we might have, as peoples, different cultures, OK? And that's wonderful, because the relationship with the ecosystem gives you the culture as well. Or you build from where uh, you live around the, the place you are. So th this is very important to acknowledge. Uh, so we have different, like grades of identity. Identity that the place you live, identity with the, the country you live, and ident identity as humans. Sometimes we lose that, those identities, but we come from a, a specific place. So you can see the secret biocultural site. Now we understand that it's a mix between the cultural and natural worlds. OK? In the, in the natural world, you can see all the ecosystems and uh, elements and the celestial elements. And this is important because we rely also in the celestial bodies. Which are the celestial bodies? The moon, the sun. Venus, Mars now is very important now. Another, uh, and even the, in cosmological ways of thinking, even the Pleiades. Those are important for us as humans, as, uh, uh, at least for, for the native peoples in Mesoamerica. And the cultural sites on the other side, those are related to deities and to buildings. You have seen uh, some structures, archaeological, archaeological zones, like very old, like the, like the ancestral temples, like, like Totihuacan. I don't know if you have seen some pictures, like the Chichen Itza, where the pyramids are built. Those are structures, OK, very old structures. So those are cultural. Some of the, in the list, some of the Natural sacred sites in Mexico, you can find from islands, from volcanoes, mountains, deserts, lakes, caves, water springs, even valleys. So those are sacred natural sites in Mexico. No, and not all the caves are sacred, but some, some caves are sacred because uh, it's where the, the people acknowledge that there is certain kind of energy. A certain kind of thing is something uh, that is important for, for the people. On the other side, and also very important, well, this is a picture of the, of the volcanoes by Mexico City. One is the volcano of, of Popocatépetl, which is this one, which is meant to be a man or a, a male. And, the, and this is the female volcano, which is Isla Cihuatl. And this is the, the same. So in the other direction, is there are cultural sacred sites in Mexico, like, like the archaeological zones, like Totihuacan, Calislahuaca, Tule, Palenque, Paquimé. And there are several, several uh, archaeological zones. When I was studying for the first time in, in the 90s, and my bachelor was in tourism, I learned that there were more than 300,000 archaeological sites in Mexico. So many, so many. And most of them, they are not discovered. They are just underground. So there are also sanctuaries like La Villa, which is very famous because of the Guadalupe Virgin. In native terms, it's called Tonantzin, which means Mother Earth. So that's important. There is a syncretism between old beliefs and, uh, and new beliefs, let's say, like in the Catholic way of, of uh, thinking. So this is the sanctuary in La Villa. This is the third construction. Before, there were other two, two ones, but they were smaller. So they had to build uh, this big one. 
And thousands and thousands of people, they do pilgrimages every day. Every, every day, and the most important one is on December 12th, when the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Virgin is the, is the day. So millions of people go every year over there. But behind this, you can find, uh, behind the, 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 the building, you find this, which is, was already sacred for the, for the Aztec and for the Ottomans. So many people who go to La Villa never, never see, never go to this place, but it's behind the, the buildings. So you can, you can see that here you, you can see the Guadalupe Virgin and the natives from the 16th century. Just, they acknowledge this place already. Is that a waterfall behind them? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it has to do with life, right? Mm -hmm. And is that a lake? Yeah. So yes, a little lake. lake. Yes. Okay. And many people even, I, I, I've been there for several years and I was not aware that, <laughs> that it was behind. So until just recently, I discovered this site. This site. So now, now we understand what biocultural is, right? It's the mixture of natural world, cultural world, and also the production of this, this uh, historical intense relationship, right, with nature and humans. So we, we can find now biocultural sacred sites. Even when you think in a, in a, in a site, it's not, it's not just natural, but it, be, beca it became or it becomes also cultural because you are thinking in that place. Even if it's just a forest. But if you think in that forest or people in collective, collective way think in that forest, it, be it becomes biocultural, okay? because you are putting your, your mind, your thoughts in, 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 that, in that place. So this is a, a Wirarika pilgrimage. This is a pilgrimage that they walk for sometimes for months uh, from one state to another. And they go and uh, they ask for the rain, for the rainy days, for the rainy seasons. But uh, you know, there are pilgrimages now in Mexico that y you take almost 28 days to go from one place to another, and there's people who does it. It's, it's wonderful because they are praying not ju just for, for them, they are praying for human beings and for, and for all creation. So that's important. So this is a, an, another biocultural sacred site. This is very beautiful. This is very beautiful. This is, is, is like the second most important uh, place in, in a sanctuary in Mexico, it's Chalma. And there are some sayings about this, but be, beneath the church, the temple, there are some caves, very sacred caves. So the priests, they don't allow to people to go to the caves, but there are special people that they are allowed to go in. Not even the priests go in, but these holy men and holy women, they go. They, they have permission to go because they have kept this, this deep relationship with the sacred place. So this is Chalma. And if you have some chance to go, nearby Chalma there is another beautiful place which is called Malinalco. It's so a beautiful place. So if you have the chance to go, that'd be nice. So now, there are so many scholars that have studied what is the importance of the mountains and the top of the volcanoes. And they have found that in most of the volcanoes and the, and the mountains, they have seen that there are, there are archaeological structures, or at least something that says that on top of the mountains, uh, people used to, to go and pray. And even now, many rituals are still carried out on top of the mountains and volcanoes, which for other religions also, the mountains are 
some religions, are, the mountains are important, right? Because they are close to the sky. In other words, they are close to the Creator. So this is important. But why, you know, I have always think how the people before used to, to do these beautiful constructions. But in Egypt, you know, the pyramids? Also in Mexico, we have pyramids and are bigger than, the, than those from Egypt. But we don't know how or why they built those beautiful buildings. Yes, now we have, we have been doing research and we have seen that some pyramids were, they were oriented. So according to the days, I'm passing through the, the months until the zenith over here. When, when the sunrise comes over here, it's on Saltis. It's in Saltis. So they knew about time and space, which is beautiful. Because now our buildings we, we build uh, sometimes just for the comfort, but we don't see this complex relationship with, with the other celestial bodies. So in those times, they were aware and they were studying so much in astronomic way of thinking and even mathematical. So we, they were building this, this, uh, these places to underscore, underscore important dates, okay? Some sacred places provide the structure and fundamental elements to carry, to carry out rituals. For example, this man is doing a ritual in order to call for the rainy seasons. But how he is feeling this place because he is in a, in a crater, he's in a crater, in a volcano. So he's, he's feeling or, he, or he's reading the elements around and he's feeling how the rainy season is going to come. And if the rainy season is going to come uh, dry, he has to perform with others some rituals to call for the rain. Okay? And it, it is happening in other places. So sometimes uh, we have forgotten that those kind of rituals, they were very basic in ancient ancestral times, but now many, many cultures around the world, they are also performing this kind of rituals in different ways. So this is La Compuerta en el Cerro Olotepec, which is a crater. Oh, you have a question. What happens if the rain doesn't come? Uh, they would perform some rituals and do some offerings okay. or some payments even. Offerings is one thing and payments is another thing. Offerings is like when you, when you buy some roses and give it to, to somebody who you love, it's an offering. But a payment is even, is even more strict. You have to, to grow your roses. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, payment is strict. You have to fasten. You have to, to do something with yourself. That's different, okay? Pilgrimages are, are payments. Actually, okay. Physically. Yes. So other sacred places are, they, they, they have a feeling of belonging because you feel you are part of the community. Uh, families come together, uh, some relatives, and in Mexico, we have this beautiful word uh, to say compadre is like a very, very near, or comadre, very near person who is kind of your brother or sister, but can be from another family, okay? So this is community, and community is wonderful. So we need to, to build communities, and sacred sites are a way to come together. So they have a feeling of belonging. Or they, they push for a feeling of belonging. So congregation in a holy place produces and reproduces a feeling of belonging 
to the group and, and, and an identification with the way of life of a culture. But why are sacred sites venerated? Because creation is nothing more and nothing else than creation of an orderly time and space lattice. So we, as humans, we live in a, in a time and a space. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we, we forget that we are living, sometimes we forget that the sun is there, and we don't even see the sun or the moon, and the day passes, and we don't, we don't live enough to admire the nature that we have. We, we were given. So sometimes we, we just wake up and go to sleep, and we don't see the days. Have you experienced that? The story of my life. OK. So that's the reason we, we need to to connect with those sacred places so we realize that creation is sacred. OK? Uh, as I told you, this is Teotihuacan. It's one of the most beautiful uh, ancient cities in, the, in Mexico. It's huge, and you can find some murals. You can find uh, very special places and behind the this is the the sun pyramid but behind this the there is another pyramid which is related to the May 3rd which is uh, and is around here and here there is another pyramid which is called the moon the moon pyramid so you can see that people used to acknowledge day and night, but not just day and night, but the process to go from the day to the night. And that's the most beautiful process, because you acknowledge that there is a transition. It's like in our lives. When you are a child, you become an adult. adult, and then you, you become to an elder. OK, so that's, that's the way. They were acknowledging. And, and you see the mountain, the mountain over here. And the construction is almost, almost the same. Did you realize that they don't, don't interrupt the landscape? So they were taking care about, about these issues. Do you, do you realize? It's beautiful. So these are, these are uh, other places, venerated places, like there are some trees. In the Mayans, they are the Seibas. But in the Otomi world and the Aztec world, these are called Aguahuetes. Those are huge, huge pines. And uh, people, uh, especially from the little communities, they go and leave the umbilical cord and, and put it over, over here about around the branches. And this is a place where the water burns. So it connects, it connects the underworld with the, with the sky. So this is a cosmovision way of thinking. <coughs> I'm not going to go over this, but just to let you know that the, the Mayan calendar, the Aztec and the Otomi calen calendars are very precise, and they have uh, Special dates like the May third, like the the day the day of the dead by November second, it just passed by. We acknowledge the life, we acknowledge the death, and the the process of of it. And August thirteen is also important. And uh, yeah, uh, this is this is very very important. You you saw before the sun was here, right? And, and they were marking the days until the until here is the sun, the the day where where the sun was for the saltis, okay, was a marker for the saltis. So sacred sites are oriented to the sun, the moon, Venus, 
even the Milky Way. Would there be a similar one for the Pleiades? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, there are other pyramids for the Pleiades. Some archaeoastronomists, they are already studying this. Okay? So they are gener generally oriented, oriented to dates that mark beginning, middle, of ending, ending of rainy season or beginning of swing season, even harvesting seasons. I don't want to detend over there, but I like to tell you that there are different sacred sites. There are sacred sites to receive the warm days. When are the warm days here to come in the United States, especially in this area? On March? No, later. Later? No. OK. In central Mexico, it's around the 20. 21st and 22nd, when the, when the new season arrived, right? So these are, these are places where for the new fire is lit in the heart of sacred sites every 21st or 22nd of March. So there are rituals. And if you go to Mexico on the 21st, for example, to Totihuacan, you are going to find thousands and thousands of people waiting for the, for the new season for the, in the solstice. Yeah, we celebrate it on the calendar, the beginning of spring mm -hmm. in March, but the weather hasn't quite caught up with us. OK. But, but it's important because it's a change, right? It's a renewal. So we acknowledge these renewals. So, and this is a deity for the, for the fire. It means that it's not, it's not a god, like it's not a god of the fire, but it's a deity, which means it's just a representation, or very close representation to what is the creation, OK? So one thing is to venerate, another thing is to, to worship, OK? So we, we, we distinguish that in the native way of being. OK? <laughs> so the sacred sites to receive hot, hot rays, you can see three, one, two, and three stones. Those are the, like the heart, right? The, the heart. And the, the fourth element is the fire. So they are placed to the, in such a way that this one represent, represent the, the wind, this one represent the, the water, and this one, this one represent the Air. earth, and this fire. The, the fire. So those are the four sacred elements of life. All of us, we have in ourselves those elements. We cannot live, life wouldn't be possible without one of this element. So we acknowledge this. So every, every year, we have a, a specific and, and a special way of receiving the hot rays because it's the energy, which means the, the rays of the sun. OK? Others, like, you know, like around August, we harvest the, the corn, but it's not dry. It's just the corn that we can eat. We call elotes. It's fresh. I, also, you, I think you have tasted them. Corn on the cob? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is around this. And we make some rituals, some fiestas around the milpa, where we grow corn. And we call milpa because we grow together corn with, with the squash and beans and chilies and so on. So all together. Nice. So we celebrate life during those, those days. I'm talking about communities. I'm not talking about big cities. So, some cities that are doing now corn gatherings. This is very important because some people fear about death, right? But 
in a, especially in the in, in Mesoamerica culture, we we are not afraid about death. We respect death, but we even make fiesta for for the death because they have gone, but we we are related to to that part as well. So we we go to the cemeteries or we put a beautiful uh, place like a table with full of fruit, food, flowers, candles, and we receive the death during those days by November 2nd. So as, as well as we receive the hot days, we receive the death. Have you seen that? Have you seen those, those kind of uh, cultural manifestation? So it's important to also to acknowledge the death. There are some sacrifices to receive the rainy days, and there are some rituals to, that are performed on the 2nd and the 3rd of May, like this one. This one is one of the rituals taking place in, in one uh, of the caves in Oaxaca. It's a southern state in Mexico. And you can see that they are putting some candles, flowers, and some little breads or kind of tamales made with, with corn. And the people go there because, yes, they want that the life continues, and they acknowledge the life. In other places, they don't have the caves, but they have the mountains, like this one. This is a sacred mountain, which is very beautiful. It's Peña de Bernal, or Villa del Bernal. It's in Querétaro State. Before, just the, the holy man, or the priest, used to, to climb up over here, or holy women. But now, because it's drier, you know, because of climate change, uh, they need more help, energetical help. So they are inviting more people to, to go for a pilgrimage on top. So they, they ask for the rainy season. And it's happening now. So more people is, more people, and more people is, is, uh, is being invited to, to go for the pilgrimage. So what, what are we looking for? We are looking for the recognition of time and space in, in sacred biocultural sites. So we have been talking with UNESCO, which is the United Nations Organization for, for the Culture and Science and Education, to acknowledge these places. Because some places are endangered, not just because uh, mining or fracking, but because they have to pass by, uh, let's say, uh, some, some construction that is not worth for, for the peoples. So they are in danger for several reasons. So we need, we, we need to protect them. What are milpas again? So yes, the milpas, this is the, where we grow corn all together with, squash. it's a concept, with the squash, oh. It's not a monocultive, it's a polycultive, okay? Yeah. That, that's the, the notion of the concept of milpa. So you can grow more than one food at the same time? That's right, and they help each other. It's like life, life. it used to be, or is, <laughs> it has to be like that. Okay, so, why are rituals important? Because they enable to rep for the reproduction of meteor meteorological cycles and of life cycles. So we need to recover, we say, time and space values of sites warranty sustainability of life cycles. Yes, because this concept of sustainability, we cannot understand if we don't love life. If we don't love life, there is no sustainability. Because if we just don't take care about uh, water, about air, so 
So would you say that in 2015 people really don't love life anymore because it seems like all around the world we're just destroying everything we see? We have we, we got a very hard uh, problem now because, because of climate change because we are not praising fundamentals the original instructions that were gi given we're destroying. for life. We are just not taking care enough. So we need to reinstill love. For yes, life. yes, that's the, that's the message. Well, I like to tell you more and more and more. But thank you so much for listening to me. I like to, if you have some, no, not just question, but some something to say, it's really nice to hear from you. Thank you. If we wanted to go to those sacred sites and like learn about them and practice or whatever the rituals, are we able to do that, or do we need to be like from there and from that religion? No, you are you are welcome. I'm welcome. Yes, you are welcome. Okay. Anyone is welcome. I think we, we need to go to so many sacred places around the world, but the only thing we need to respect is life. the life and and the the beliefs. Even if you don't agree with those beliefs, you got to respect and learn. Okay? Uh, could you tell us more about the Earth Center at Columbia University and what type of resources students from culture classes or seminars students would be able to attend? Uh, I want to leave my, my, uh, my card. And you can type on the on the web page, Earth for Center for Earth Ethics, and you are going to find you are going to find the different programs we have. And the program uh, the program I'm yeah. mostly doing Sorry. is about caretakers. We are bringing the wisdom of native peoples to speak about their not just about their way of living but about prophecies. Have you heard about prophecies, right? So there is a prophecy very important, at least for the Americas, which is, is called the condor and the eagle prophecy. So we need to come together as peoples. Wait, what's that prophecy? The condor and the eagle. What did it say? That we have to come together and share values and share all this knowledge so we can survive because time it's becoming very hard. Mm -hmm. It's very, very hard now to, to survive in this. And you, you can see that tornadoes and uh, earthquakes and all of this uh, stuff is now is more frequent. For the first time in Mexico, we have been hit by, by a tornado that was, uh, uh, it was not a tornado, it was a hurricane. Hurricane. It was category number four. It didn't destroy so much, but they are coming. They are coming. So we, we don't know how much we are going to be hurt, but we need to be prepared. So what, what I want to let you know is that you better begin to learn how to, to grow your own food. <laughs> little by little. Who knows if it is going to be next year or it, during 15 or 60 years. Who knows? We, were, we better be prepared. This is one message that I have been uh, said by the elders. But it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. So prophecies are passing now. The, what was it, condor and eagle? The condor and eagle. Right. You, you can find it in, in the internet as well. So the, about the, the caretakers. So we are giving the opportunity for different beliefs, different religions to come together with natives and share, and share wisdom, share, share the world, the world and the presence. Because many people around the world, we have, lo we have lost direction. We, we don't know where to go, so we need to, to go back to the origins. 
So and it's very, very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to rethink how our life is going to be in 20 years or in, in 50 years. But I, what I can tell you is that these two weeks coming, there's going to be a conference in Paris, the COP 21st, for the climate change. And if there is not a good agreement, you know, they are fighting to, for two centigrade below. But if they don't come to an agreement, it's going to go up. And the life in some places around the planet is going to be very bad. Tuvalu, which is an island in the Pacific Ocean, is going to disappear. It's already, they already have had very hard times. 30,000 people are waiting for a new place to stay because their national state an island, as an island is disappearing. They, they were here in the, in the Center for Earth Ethics and they, they don't want to leave their island, but it's a need and they are moving little by little. They want that space in another place. So it's happening, it's happening. The melting of the, yeah. And you know, some people, they talk about this white bear, remember? And they don't have a space and they, because they, they have to swim and they, they are losing their, their places. But we, we could disappear before than the, the white bear because they can resist bigger uh, centigrades or Fahrenheit than humans. Much more. You said the white bird? Yeah, they Why can. They call the white bird? Oh, the white bird. The white bears, white bears. I see. Yeah, I humans, we cannot stand so much the, the heat, but they can, and even the cold, okay? So we are in, in danger as, 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 as a species, we are in danger. A danger to ourselves. Yes. So any other? Oh, hi, yes, I have a question. Can you speak about other endangered species that are vital to sur our survival, like the bees? Yes, I think the, the bees, you know, uh, they help so much to nature and to, to Can ourselves. Can you tell us how they help? Uh, most of the bees came from Europe, right? Like the ones that we get honey. But they were also a species around Mexico and Central America, which is called melipona. They don't have poison. They, they are just tiny. And the, the honey is very... It's so rich, but most than, than producing honey, they help for the flowers to, you know, to... Pollinate. Yes. How do you say? Pollinate. The, yeah, for pollinization purposes. So there are some places around the world that humans have to pollinate the flowers because there are not any more uh, Be bees. So, that, so we are in, in a very uh, bad situation in some places because there, there is no more. And because of, you know, our cellulars or microwaves and all of this, they are killing. And ye, 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 MMOs, how do you call it? Genetic modified organi organisms? They are also GMOs, right? They are also killing the insects, among them, the bees. And, that, and that's very bad because we are losing ways of, of, of life. That's the reason they are very important. Two questions. The first one, um, for some of the uh, indigenous or First Nations people that are, have this more nature-based uh, cosmology or religion, are there things they do every day to worship as part of their religious practice? Like praying to something or making an offering or is there usually more longer calendar type stuff? Uh, both. 
uh, it depends the culture and it depends the community. There are some communities that they really go every day, even when they eat. There are, there are native cultures that they acknowledge where the food came from and they give to Mother Earth a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a gesture, but you acknowledge. And of course, especially in important dates, we do ceremonies. Mm -hmm. I could say that I always give thanks for the food I'm eating mm -hmm. and for the hands that they were produced and the hands that they made the food. Mm -hmm. So we acknowledge life. Yeah. So. Uh, I came a little late. Uh, is there like one God or like a book? Or I don't even know what religion we were talking about because I came a little late. Is there like a name for it? The... It's not really a religion. It's just belief. It's a spirituality. So there's no one, one God, like a name? There, is a, there, there, is a, there are names for God. And it's the name, it's the same God as... Everybody else, right? Yes. I know. That's, it's the that's same. That's where I was going. It's the same. Is. It's just different names. Just a different way to interpret them. Yeah, because some were saying that we worship so many gods, but it's not true. So, because in, in for example, in my language, we call Makihmu, mm -hmm. which is Everything. the creator. Could you say that again? Makihmu. Makihmu. Yes, and it has to to be with the en uh, energy, oh. with with the Makimu. yeah Makihmu. And others called in, in Aztec, they call Ometeotl, but it's God. It's also so the same. So is there yes. a book that tells you what's right, what's wrong? How is there like live? a Bible? Uh, there are some uh, books, holy books, but you, but you need to read them that's like three, four. There, there, there is there a Mayan there. book. There is a, two Mayan books. Uh, one is called, uh, let me, Popol Buh. Popol? Popol Buh. How do you spell that? P-O. Okay. Popol Vu. And could you write down the Maki Vu? Oh, yes. I really want to go and do that. Maki Some of these words are not very well known by others, but it's how we call mm -hmm. in our rituals. OK? So just let me, for the, I don't know how many minutes I have. OK. So I like to, because I, I can. Can yes. I ask one more question? Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the, the, what you, uh, yes. Yes, this yes. one? Well, uh, this is jade, okay. and jade was the most precious stone in ancestral times in Mesoamerica. But especially this kind of jade, which is, is not completely green, mm -hmm. it's white and green, is very rare. Mm -hmm. So it was given by my grandpa, my grandfather, but I think it, it, it is very old, like more than 1,000 years old. Oh, yeah. Because he was taking care about some things that he gave it to me. I, I, I am a, a guardian of those of those uh, objects, sacred objects, that you can find just in some museums. But this kind of jade, you cannot find find it even in the museums. Mm -hmm. This kind. There are so, so many other kinds. So I have two very rare jades that. And are usually only worn by people who are guardians. Uh, yes, yes, okay. yes. You cannot find people who, who hold this kind, uh, especially because these are very old. You can see the, mm -hmm. the structure was made uh, wide at the beginning and then thin oh. at the center. Okay. How do you become a guardian? Just by, by acknowledging, because we were so many grandsons, but I was, I was I went to the milpa, and I found some of these beautiful objects, and I was putting them in the, in the sacred place in the altar in, in, in my house. So my grandpa was looking watching at me, you. watching me. So he had, he had no doubt to whom to give this, 
this obvious. So you, you, you gain yourself. Awesome. Yeah. And I was going to tell you something else. The beans? Oh, yeah. Question. Grandfather, you want to repeat your last question? It was well, about the beans. Well, eh? She asked you yeah. about the beans. I, I remember. My, my grandma, which was a wonderful woman, a very strong woman, she was enlightened by the thunderbolt. Have you heard about that? She was struck by lightning? Yes, but with no, with no noise, just like the, the light. Oh my God. So she, fa she fainted. And one of my aunties went to pick her, pick her up. And he, they didn't have to. But they made a mistake, so because another uh, light had to wake her up. So she was kind of dead for two weeks. She was not eating, she was not doing anything, just from bed. So after 15 days, she woke up and she couldn't speak, she couldn't say anything. She was just walking a little bit. And uh, she said, don't follow me to, the, to, my aunt, to my aunties. And she went in the back of the house and where we grow uh, fruits, trees, and she found this beautiful, beautiful gift that God gave it to her. It was a medal, kind of with the stripes, with leather stripes. She found a red leather book, and she found uh, we call ramo. We call this kind of uh, sacred plant. So she came back and said to my mom, "When I die, I want them. I, I want you to put my things in my in this place." Ever since, ever since, she began to to chew tobacco, and she could heal any, any sicknesses, any sickness, just by, by putting tobacco in, in the place where it was the sickness. So, but because she didn't want to be named witch, you know, <laughs> she was just healing family, or our family. And once in a while, so, some, somebody who, really was very, very close to the family. But for, for one, and you can see now, the, even the physicians, they cannot heal their, their own children. You have to be very powerful in order to, to heal your own family. But my grandma, she had the power to heal. And, and I saw it because I was one of his, <laughs> He's, uh, well, uh, how to say when you go to the doctor and see? Her patience. I was <laughs> of, of, of her patience. Yes, so it, it was so. So, um, all these people that are there, they chose them by the gods in some ways. So when they die, they pass those powers or something to the next generation, or they just keep being chosen by others? There are several ways. There are ways that uh, the person who holds this knowledge, they, they choose, or they, they chose uh, somebody else. Other, other times, they just a direct gift from God. Others, they dream and they get knowledge. Others, they have to go to the cave for so many years, like the Kogis, have you heard about the Kogis? No? The Kogis and the Sagas are the holy men and holy women in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia. Could you put that up on the board? There's yes. There are uh, two, different, two different ways of... Kogi or Kogis. And there is a, a movie about this called Aluna. Aluna. You watch for it. You are going to like it. Aluna. You, you can download from the internet. 
and you are going to be amazed. You know, in order to become a, a, a saga or a mamo. A sage, right? No, no, saga. A saga? Mamo is, is the title. They have to go into the cave for the 13 years without watching the, the, the sun rays. So they go into deep connection. And you know how, how much information they get? How much knowledge? And from, from what tribe are they? The Kogis. Yeah, that, that's the name of the tribe? Yes. Okay. So there are different ways of getting this knowledge. So it depends about the culture, it depends about the, the territory, the land, the, the beliefs. Yeah, in some cases, yes. In some cases, that's, that's the way. Because the Kogis, for example, they have to teach how to go to the cave, how to fast. Because most of the times they have to fast. And in many traditions, you know, we have to fast in order to, to acknowledge life. But it has to be someone from the same tribe, or can we just someone I've heard that there are some hailers now even from the United States who go to the volcanoes in Mexico. I met a woman in Ghost Ranch, not the time we met before, because I was given a workshop. And this woman was uh, his, her mentor, was a, a man from Mexico, and she learned, and she was given this gift. So she now, now uh, do uh, her work. He does, she does her work here in the United States. So it can be learned as well. But it depends what, what is about or what kind of knowledge. Oh, for anyone who's wondering how I met Mr. Mendaki, I met him at Ghost Ranch, where he was part of a panel about Native American wisdom. And I found out that he was going to be working at Columbia University this year at the Earth Center, and I asked him to come and speak to all of you, and I hope that you gain something valuable from the things that he shared with you. And we still have a, another like five or six minutes, so if there's something else you'd like to ask, this is the time hmm. to do it. Somebody else? Or, or I, can, I can, because I, I wrote this, uh, this, you know, in here I have not just tobacco, but I have a special instrument that is very old. It's an armadillo whistle. So when I, when I play, play it, I ask you to close your eyes and connect for a little seconds, even for a minute, just to become part of the universe. So can we do that? Yeah. Okay. So please close your, your eyes a little bit. So did you feel something different? Some of you, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some. Could you tell us a little more about that object that you used? The whistle. Yes. This this whistle. 
I was in the Mayan lands uh, three years ago, and I found this, this holy man who was taking care about Mashimon. Mashimon is, a, is an old deity in, by the Atitlan Lake in the highlands of the Maya in, in, in Guatemala, Maya lands. And this, this man who was taking care about this Mashimon, which is, is a rail, rail man, which is a very old, like saint, let's say, you know. So they had this beautiful place, and because I was acknowledging all deities, he approached me and he said that he was in charge of this uh, temple, and he gave it to me, and he said that I should play it for to, for to raise consciousness about life. So I am sharing with you this. And this is very object, and very object uh, old, very old object, uh, Mayan armadillo whistle. Wow. Yeah. What's the drum? Uh, this drum is uh, Professor uh, Kessler. Yes, it's from the Taos Pueblo, and it was made for me to teach my students more about Native Americans. So you know the drums were one of the very first instruments that human beings created at the beginning because it was like that, heart bumping. It's a hollow down. Napaya Dinagon Kiki Te Grofedi Te Gracia Godabini Te Grofedi Bukina Pagipadi Oshikigi, Huabro Shendo y Shendo, Higi Kati Kaika, Bujina Toke Kwada, Bujina Shikigi, Huabro Zumi. Yes. What did you say? Uh, it's a beautiful uh, song that we composed, and it's, uh, it talks about you, who you are. Do you know why you came from, uh, to this holy earth? You must figure out, because we came for some purpose. I think I figured out. And uh, it, this song talks, talks about this issue, that why we are here as humans, how we relate to others, and, and really, we need to, to take care about life. This is what he talks about. So, Teglofedi, who you are. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me, and it has been a pleasure.